Hello. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. Scholars, and welcome back to yet another fun filled, action packed adventure. Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger, a professional artist and master educator attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. As always, when we educate ourselves, we become educated. I greatly appreciate any sort of likes, shares, subscribes, comments, interactions are much appreciated. Thank you very much for the consideration on this point. This is how you repay me. So anybody that's probably watched this channel for any length of time has gathered. I'm more into drawing and, and 2D uh, sorts of art production and, and uh, color pencil and ink media personally. But I've also been very well versed and trained and also the media of photography. I have taught wet lab photography. I've taught digital photography. And today I want to give you an overview, kind of an overarching um, idea of some of the artists and some of the creations and some of the photographs that have really influenced the artistic media of photography. The word photography is rooted in a Greek term that means to write with light. Photography as we know it today has two major components or phenomena. Phenomena. These phenomena make it work, and they are the optical phenomena and the chemical phenomena. The optical is the ability to control and direct light's ability to form an image. This is a process that was developed way back in the 4th century BC with a guy by the name of Aristotle. In his camera obscura or darkroom, Aristotle found that he could get an upside down image by using a lens through a darkened room. The artists of the Renaissance would use this idea to develop drawing aids and so forth, but sadly these images of life were in no way permanent. The chemical phenomena would make these a permanent record by the recording of light and its formation of an image. Johann Heinrich Schulz began this path of chemical compounds containing silver with very positive results. Silver's photochemical reaction was further used by others including Jacques Daguerre and his daguerreotype process. The daguerreotype is considered the first camera, developed in 1839. However, the technology was being explored as early as 1826. These early cameras used copper plates along with silver compounds treated over iodine. Developing the images on these metal plates required placing them over boiling mercury. The mercury particles adhered to the points on the plate where the plate itself was exposed to light. Side note, Daguerre's Boulevard du Temple is the first photograph to include a human within it. He had taken several street scenes, but because it took 15 minutes to create a single image, the people that were moving around basically made themselves disappear in the frame. However, this particular person was getting their shoes shined and held still long enough to be captured on film. You have to feel something permanent. William Talbot, who invented the negative-positive process in 1860, improved on this process. The negative-positive process allowed this to be created on a glass plate, but now using rolled film in 1860, multiple prints could be created from one negative. Before photography was ever thought of as an art form, it was used as a media of the journalists. Photography really got its big break during the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848, which was a war over the U.S. expansion south, and photographers would largely use the daguerreotype process to inform the public about what was happening. By 1860, magazines and newspapers were able to print photographs in their publications using the photo engraving process. 
This would become a very handy tool for photographers of the American Civil War, namely Matthew Brady. In his mobile darkroom, he and his assistants took thousands of photographs that showed both sides of the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. Mr. Brady would hire several assistants to help him, including Alexander Gardner, Timothy O'Sullivan, and William Jackson. Jackson in particular would go on to have a very successful career in his own right. He would take some of the first photographs of the American West, mining towns, and the construction of the railroads. Some of his best photographs were sent to the U.S. Congress, and after viewing these images of an odd geologic region of the U.S. Western Territory, would persuade Congress to establish the first national park at Yellowstone National Park in what is now known as Wyoming and little nibbits of Idaho and Montana. Yeah. William Jackson, like many photographers, was very aware that society was changing and the public should know about these changes. Social documentation is an area of photography that shows images of society that either need to be reformed or preserved. But I don't like it when things aren't my, going my way. Some of the first examples of this documentation in our American past began in the early 1900s. Labor movements, social gossip, and the need for social work were all photographed. The photographic documentation caused reform. This need came again in the 1930s when our country had its biggest time of social documentation. The Farm Security Administration hired many photographers to report on the Great Depression. Many of the photographers came on board with areas of specialization. Walker Evans was documenting immigrants in poverty. Dorothea Lang specialized in migrant workers. Arthur Rossentine focused on the Midwest Dust Bowl, and so on and so forth. We're fighters for truth, justice, and the American way. Some of these photographers could be labeled as muckrakers. A muckraker is a person who shoots photos of bad things to get a change to occur. The capturing of images of war would not end, sadly, during the American Civil War, but would continue to World War II and beyond. If your pictures aren't good, you're not close enough. These are great words of wisdom from one of the great photographers of the greatest generation, press photographer Robert Kappa, who was the only press photographer in the first wave of infantry that landed on Normandy, France on June the 6th, 1944. He landed at dawn with Company E of the 2nd Battalion of the 16th Regiment of the 1st Division on Omaha Beach. As bullets tore holes through the water, Kappa was shooting his camera. He would head for protection behind a burned out tank and would reach it between floating bodies. He attempted to reload his camera for the fifth time, but mentally and physically he could not. He ran to an incoming boat, and as he climbed on board, he felt an explosion. He would say that the skipper was crying. His assistant had been blown up all over him, and he was a mess. Mr. Kappa would shoot 106 photographs on four rolls of film. He would take a series of boats that would get him to England with a shipload of wounded and immediately return to Normandy after handing his film off to be processed so they could be created into a first run of prints. He ordered the Life magazine darkroom to rush the processing. They had to ship the photos from London to New York and an assistant rushed from the darkroom almost hysterical, screaming, the films are ruined, ruined. The assistant had hung the film in a locker that served as a drying cabinet, which was a normal practice. However, because of the rush, they closed the door and there was too much heat built up in the cabinet and the emulsion, the light sensitive material on the plastic film, got too hot and began to melt off of the plastic. Much of the film was nothing but gray soup on three of those rolls of film. But on the fourth, there were 11 discernible images. These are the only images of the actual combat. Paying attention to the process matters. Photojournalism itself is telling a story with photos. And these 11 photos tell a great story, although quality photography can tell unbelievably great stories. Oh, wow! These boring stories are really exciting! Whew. 
And it was not until 1950 that photography actually became accepted as an art form. In the beginning, the public was reluctant to accept photography as a form of art, mostly because it relied on a mechanical device. Today, however, most people agree that the camera is seen as a vehicle for personal expression and symbolic communication. One of the early crusaders in making photography an art form was Alfred Stieglitz, who opened a photography gallery in New York in 1905. He also founded an influential magazine, Camera Work, which published photographs along with essays about modern art and culture. Stieglitz's own photography was almost always what we would call straight. There was no technical manipulation of the negative, it was just what it was. In his 1903 photograph of the Flatiron Building, Stieglitz arranged visual fields so that they could echo each other. The basic shapes of the foreground tree is an answer to the standard trees in the midground, but the fork of its branches also suggests the angle of the building. Like the foreground trees, this building seems to emerge from the ground, an impression supported by rows of benches in the snowy park. In early photographs, such as this one, Stieglitz showed the poetry that he found in a quiet urban scene. Other photographers went beyond the camera to achieve innovative effects. Man Ray made innovative photographs, which he called rayographs, by placing objects on light-sensitive paper and exposing them to light. These so-called photos are not really photographs, and no camera or lens was used in the creation. Sometimes, like this work here, it is not clear what the original subject even was. Near the end of the 20th century, commercial photographic negatives began to go out of fashion under the impact of new digital photography. Now most cameras don't use film, rather, the lens focuses information onto an array of sensors that relate the hue and intensity of light onto a digital file. Do I look like I know what a JPEG is? These files can be manipulated in an almost infinite number of ways and easily reproduced. I would say that the vast majority of us today have a very sophisticated camera in our phones in our pockets at all times. The implication of these changes are profound. If a photograph can be altered, then its reputation as a vehicle of truth is in danger. And if the camera can indeed lie, and with easy reproduction, the specialness of photography is indeed reduced. Any contemporary photographer can take advantage of these facts. In today's world, many photographers have gotten into big time trouble for misrepresenting and altering the photos that they put out for the public when those photos are represented as photojournalism. However, when they're represented as art, pretty much all bets are off, anything goes. If you'd like to hear more about these or other photographers, please shoot me a line down in the comments. On the internet, worldwide. Hey, what do I know? I color for a living. But that is a great story. Thank you for watching. I gave